worship service today. Uh, if you're part of the church family, it's good to see you again. It's really good to be here. Uh, if you're visiting, I was going to say it's not normally like this, but it probably is normally like this. So here's what I want to introduce as a thought for us today. Who you follow has determined who you've become. And who you follow or what you follow will determine still who you will be down the road. Fo follower is not a bad thing. I think sometimes we get the idea that if we say follower, that's a weak thing. Everybody follows someone or something. We all have a course and a track that we, we didn't set ourselves. We're born into a stream of something that sent us that way. The core of that idea of following is what disciple and discipleship is all about. Sometimes the most common Christian words are the most ill-defined words and ideas for us as Christians. We just, we hear it so much, we begin to take it for granted, and maybe you felt like I did when I became a Christian. If everyone seemed to know, you didn't want to ask. What, what does that really mean? So we've been in a series called The People of God, going through the entire Bible. We're into the New Testament, and we're talking about the Gospels. And, and we've been to several places already. We, we've heard how uh, Jesus entered in that transitional period, the last prophet of the Old Testament, first of the New Testament, John the Baptist, ushered him in, and, and we saw the temptation in the wilderness after his baptism. We talked in the Gospel of John about the significance of John writing about water and all the amazing ways that this carries out as a theme throughout the Gospel. And, and today, we're going to follow through on what we've been talking about last, the, the kingdom of God. That when Jesus showed up, if there's a theme of Jesus' message and work throughout the Gospels, it said he came preaching the kingdom. And it wasn't just words. He demonstrated powerfully that he was the king that the Bible spoke about. And, and now we're going to talk about something else that you can't miss about Jesus if you were look at the Gospels. He was a disciple maker. You, you can't talk about Jesus and the people of God without talking about this idea of following after, being shaped by, being a student of. When Jesus calls to somebody, they have to respond. That, that's the nature of discipleship. That's the formula. Jesus says something, we go after that. All calls need a response. If someone ever called your name, you know what that is like. Someone yells for you, and you turn and look. Someone maybe who's a higher rank at work says, hey, do this. I need you to do this. And you hear your name called, and you go and respond. I can remember as a boy, my Italian grandmother, who um, this, this woman did not speak English. She had in her kitchen a picture of the Virgin Mary sweeping the floor while looking blissfully up at the heavens, right? So this, this woman was pure domestic Italian bliss from the old country. So her food was amazing. And I didn't really speak Italian, but when I would hear my grandmother say, Supe caldo, venia mangiare, I knew it was time to respond to a call. Whatever she had made, it just means the soup's hot, come eat. And it wasn't soup, it, it, anything, it was just the expression was that. We go running back because it was a call and we responded. If you have nothing else today when we're at the end of this, remember that. Disciples are men, women, and children who hear the call of Jesus on every level and simply respond to it. Here's the roadmap of today that we're going to walk through. First, we'll talk about how everyone is a disciple. Everybody who's ever existed, will ever exist, exists now as a disciple of someone or something. Second, these are really like hard principles to get, but here's the second. Christians are disciples or followers of Jesus, and then we're uniquely something. We're both disciples and disciple makers at the same time. We can't just live with one and forget the other. They both have to keep happening. I'm going to read a passage from the Gospel of John. So if you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 1 or flip over to John chapter 1. If you don't, just put your hand up and someone will bring you a Bible so that you can look on today or keep and continue to, to look and search from that Bible to, to hear the call of Jesus. And I do see a hand upstairs just so you folks with the Bible know that as well. All right, John chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 35 to verse 51. We'll pray and we'll go through the word today. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. 
One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You're Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael, and Nathanael said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see truly greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened, and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Let's pray together. Father, we open your word, and we ask that you would enliven us to hear your call. Lord, we know it says that your word won't return void. You will bring a response. You will bring holiness. You will have us leave sin in our wake. You will make us more like Jesus. You will help us to be what we were designed to be, the image of God. You will redeem and restore as we hear. So, Lord, by the power of your spirit, help us to be awake to your word and responding to your word. Help each man, woman, and child here to determine their course of discipleship and following you in this time today. We ask this in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen. So the word disciple in the Bible, there's not any mysticism to it. It's the word for student or learner or follower. It's a common word, not just a religious word, right? You could be a disciple, a a mathetes, a student, a follower, and not have it be religious. If you were a devotee of a philosopher, they might say that you were a disciple of that philosopher. Both the Jewish community and Christian community understood this, and the Greek community had their version of disciple, someone who was a student or a follower, and it's not exclusively a biblical word. I know in the 21st century it's not used a whole lot, But when someone is a fan of something or a follower of something or heavily into something, we could say in that day, they're disciples of that. And no person starts on their own and uniquely and inspirationally decides, this is who I will be without any influence whatsoever. It is such a ridiculous and arrogant thought to even have to say, but we we enter into the world already made disciples We have parents, and your parents discipled you. Their culture that they lived in, that they assumed was the way things were, the things they intentionally taught, the things they said told us not to do, they taught us. They discipled us. Even, and it's a powerful thing, discipleship, when they didn't know they were doing it. When the little things happened that we picked up on that they thought, oh, I wouldn't want them to pick up on that. It's actually one of the most heartbreaking things of a parent when you see your sin being reproduced in your children. You didn't try to teach them that. You're just you sometimes, and they see the good and the bad. We were discipled from the beginning. We're often a disciple of even larger things in the family. We're, we're discipled, or at least there's a constant effort to be discipled, by the spirit of our times. There are constant messages. People get paid a lot of money to try to disciple you, to try to call you so that you hear and change your life according to what they're saying. Advertising is just the 21st century's way of saying we're trying to disciple you in what we want you to do commercially, how we want you to behave economically or, or even in the ways that we're trying to create culture so that you go out and buy the accoutrements that are cool right now and watch the stuff that's in right now. Someone's always going to try to disciple you. I know before I was a Christian, there were a lot of things I bought into at different times that I'd heard from other people or saw generally at large in the culture. And over years, I've had to undo courses that I went down, things that I believed. Can I tell you, it's one of the most frustrating things in life. Some of you know what I'm talking about. When you have to unlearn something that you learned and practiced and thought was the right thing, to undo a wrong thing to correct is such a long and frustrating process at times. It's... It's the worst part of bad discipleship. So I would say think very carefully, especially you who are young. 
What's shaping you? Who's shaping you? Who's discipling you? Discipleship can be subtle and small. It can look like just adherence of an idea. It doesn't seem very personally. I believe these things. It, it can be a, about a thing and not just a person, that we're fans of something. But when Jesus shapes us, when we are called by God incarnate, God come to earth, who would command us as a king, it's different than any other discipleship that you've ever known. Every other influence is different in quality and different in the nature than Jesus calling us. John records a process of discipleship in the, in the life of Jesus and his disciples in the first century. And I want us to look at how Jesus shapes and makes these men and women his disciples. It, it begins with the simple fact, disciples of Jesus follow after him. Followers of Jesus look to Jesus, listen to Jesus, and end up becoming like Jesus. And it all begins simply with seeing. We heard it in today's reading. The, the disciples come to Jesus in verse 38 and before, and they've asked, Rabbi, where do you live? It seems a rather indirect question. If their real question is, what are you teaching, and, and where should we go follow you? This is sort of the awkward hitting on a rabbi pickup line. Like, they can't really come out and say it. It's just, so, um, you rabbi around here a lot? And Jesus <laughs> sees right through it and says, look, Come see. I'm not going to tell you like where my Airbnb is. Just come see. You can watch me. This is what you should do. C come see everything about me. Come see where I live. Come see how I live. That's how discipleship was done. It, it wasn't a series of 10 booklets that were different colored and numbered, though. You know what? There's some value to those kinds of things, but those are just tools to help you in discipleship. Discipleship was about coming and seeing, putting yourself in the way of Jesus, intentionally putting your eyes on Jesus so that through your senses you'd be able to see. That's Jesus' first call to discipleship. He doesn't say believe everything that every preacher, dogma, church, creed, or doctrine has said. He begins to these people saying, come and see. Know who I am. Sometimes I think we want to disciple people or be discipled by come and know. Give me all the information so I can own it and grasp it the way I did a course in school. But Jesus doesn't give us that in discipleship. He says, walk with me. They'll, they'll pick it up. Because when, when Philip is asked questions by Nathaniel, he's excited. He's starting to talk about Jesus. And he's asked, can anything good come out of Nazareth? His response in verse 46, it's just what he heard Jesus say. Come see. This is a beautiful thing, too. You don't, you don't have to know all the answers. You just point in that first step of discipleship really would love for you to know more about Jesus. Yes, but what about heaven and hell, time? Where does time go? I want to know how many angels can dance out of a pen. You say, look, come, come see. Come take a look at Jesus. Discipleship in Christ calls us to be focused on the biggie on the eye chart. Sometimes as Christians, we spend all of our time down on lines 15 through 30 talking about the littlest things where discipleship calls us, look to Jesus. Let me take a moment to say to you who might be here and thinking, I'm, I'm not a Christian. I know I'm not. I'm, I'm just here at church. I'm trying. I'm trying to understand. Come see is the place for you to start. If you're like most other human beings, you're going to want like the most mysterious thing that bothers you answered. You're going to want everything that you think is wrong with the world spelled out. But that's not where Jesus is going to begin discipleship and the call to a Christian. I promise you those things get clearer and clearer. But the first piece of advice I would give you if you're serious about looking is just look to Jesus. I actually don't read a whole lot of other books about Jesus. Look at the Gospels and start reading and see who Jesus is and what he says. That's where it begins. And if you are a Christian, make sure you're still doing that. Behold him. Books about him are great. Time with other followers and believers, great. Singing about him, great. We have to constantly look towards him. Fix your heart on him. Come and see today more of Jesus. If we're following after someone who is eternal God, there is more to see in Jesus that you have not seen as a disciple yet. Don't get into this rut where you think I'm done. I know the basic doctrine. I could pass the quiz. I, I kind of know most of the songs. I know all the lingo. These weren't hard things to capture. Being with Jesus, that's harder. That will take a lot more time and more commitment. Jesus will say to the disciples that he will move them from just coming and seeing to following him. Follow me is where John shows us is the next place of his discipleship process. The language changes. Come see is a really safe, open invite. 
If you're a spectator at something, you're not really involved. You're just watching. Nothing's demanded of you. You're just watching, and then you can leave. But when the call is then, now that you've seen, follow me, you're going to divide that room. A portion of people say, well, I'm not ready, or I don't want that, or I don't know enough yet. And a portion will turn and say, it's not just about eyes anymore. It's now feet, hands, and body. I actually have to engage to follow Jesus. Seeing and getting data is all fine and fun, but it's not what brings transformation and constant life with Jesus. We have to be people who now follow. There's a kind of person who likes to see, but never likes to stay. Do you know these folks at all? They're, they're people who like to say things like, I'm spiritual. So I just sort of take a cursory look at everything that seems sort of spiritual. I don't look too deep, because then I might see there are actually contradictory difference between these two spiritual camps. And I just want to sort of see everything as the same and spiritual. Translated, I don't want to make a decision. I don't want to follow anybody, and I don't want to work that hard. But boy, I'd like to be respected as a spiritual person. This takes away that ground from them. Jesus doesn't say, come see, and then go check everything else out. At some point in this come see, Jesus says, follow me. Not follow a host of ideas. Not follow a host of other religions. Not say all things are equal. Follow me. Discipleship changes the course of these people's life, physically and literally. And it's probably a good place for us to ask, how have I changed? Am I a person who saw, maybe stayed a little while, but I wandered away, and I, I don't think I'm following? Or can I, can I kind of look at my life and track it over the years and say, you know what? Following Jesus has made me a very different person. I'm not going to go into great detail, but every now and again, my wife will rehearse for me who I was when she first met me. And it's awkward. Part of it is I, I get a little blushy. There's some stupid stuff. Part of it is I've seen the movie. I was there. I know the dumb stuff. Can we not rehearse all of it? And yet, she will do it to encourage me. The only time she does it, they're not, she does, I mean, I think she probably thinks about me all day, but it's not like it's just gushing over. She, she seems to do this when I, I for some reason, am, am living in a little bit of doubt. And for, Come on, I mean, that's not vain. It's just, uh, so I, I try to think, what is she doing? And most of the time, she's trying to tell me, remember, he has changed you. It's not just today's difficulties. It's not who you are right now. He has changed you. Never forget, disciples, if you've seen that following in your life. Take some time today at some point. Just reflect. What has your journey of following Jesus brought as a change in your life? I think you'll find yourself celebrating that you chose to follow after him, that he called you to follow after him. And if you're a person who, who can't see anything, you may be one of those folks who saw but never stayed. Follow after. Jesus will still call. Seeking only after our, ourself, I'm um, sorry, see, uh, seeing only asks for ourself, what, what's the revelation? Following says, what's the transformation? That I begin to turn and things change. The, the come see quickly in John. In our reading today, it became follow me. And for others, it continued to be follow me and say different things about discipleship. In John 8, 12, for example, it says, Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Following Jesus, he says, will bring you clarity. If you walk after me, you will see where you are going, because I'm going to reveal where I'm leading you and what I'm doing. If you've lived your life thinking, I just have no idea. I'm pretending day to day. I'm trying to grasp at something, but I'm never sure. Jesus says, I will bring you clarity. And he says he will work with you personally. John 10, 27 says, my sheep hear my voice and follow. He will call after you. He will guide and direct you if you keep leaning into him. And it will bring a presence of Jesus, not just an obedience to ideas if we follow this way. John 12, 26 says, if anyone serves me, that's part of the following, abiding. It's not just seeing. You're doing what the Lord says. He must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. It's a closeness to the Son and a, a, a blessed heart from the Father towards you as we follow after him. But there are verses in following Jesus that aren't just the wonderful, happy thoughts. 
Luke 9.23 says this. And he said to all, so not hidden, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and daily follow me. The cross in the first century was not the thing you most complained about. See, as Christians, at some point, we made the cross that, right? My cross to bear is daylight savings and how tired I am. My cross to bear is Wisconsin did really poorly in basketball this year. My cross to bear is my in-law. This is, this is hypothetical. Um, our cross to bear is, don't want to get in trouble. She's, she's always thinking about me. I don't want them to be bad thoughts. Um, that's not what they thought. When Jesus said, take up your cross daily and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to have to deal with my sore big toe and bunion daily, Jesus. No, they thought, he's talking about death. He's talking about execution, a painful death that puts you on public display and rejection. If Jesus said to disciples today, I need you guys to take up daily the lethal injection needle and count yourselves as dead to follow after me, I think it would change discipleship. See, as, as Billy Graham had said, salvation's free. It will cost you nothing. God paid for that all. But discipleship will cost you everything you have and everything you are. You count yourself as dead in order to follow after. And that's what makes the change visible. When a disciple, a man, woman, child, yields everything that we have to Jesus and starts saying, your commands, they will direct my paths, you will see the change in people. Let me illustrate it this way without putting any one person on the spot. You can see it in people groups when the gospel is received. And I, and I know that's a dicey thing historically. There were some times where leaders would say, we're now a Christian country, and everyone just said, yay. And you know, there was no real conversion. And there were times where the gospel went and a majority of people converted. So we'll take, as we head towards St. Patrick's Day, Ireland. Ireland before Patrick is a ferocious place. It is basically like um, rival biker gangs living on an island lawlessly, right? I mean, just anywhere you want to go with that, you're probably just about right in the way that the Irish were. They were brutal. Um, there was no security practically for anybody. Nothing seemed to be particularly sacred. And, and Patrick ends up in Ireland just as, as a way of life for these people because they raid nearby places and steal human beings to put them in slavery. They, they take young women and sell them to men. They take young men and sell them to people who need laborers. They're brutal. There is no unified field. The people constantly see themselves as threats to each other. And then Patrick will escape, come back, preach the gospel. We'll, we'll see people who uh, commit to Jesus, whole cities and towns, take the name church uh, that still exists in Ireland today. It's Carrig, if you see that as a prefix or suffix. And it moves from this rogue nation of slavers to being the place of saints and scholars who preserve Western history and Christianity during the Dark Ages. Those are two very different people. Th think about the Vikings. The, the, the Northmen are the, the last people in Europe to turn to the gospel. They, they were also a people who were really brutal to everybody and very standoffish with everybody. And yet when they convert, the rating stops. They become people now who are devout and pious and start to build different architecture and buildings. Communities change overnight in their conversion. Discipleship that is brought about from Jesus calling and people following brings a marked change in your life. I just want to encourage you, if you have that, keep going. It doesn't have to be perfection instantly, but you've seen change. Good. Jesus is working in you. If you haven't, I want to shake you up a little and say you may just be a person in church who's not really following Jesus, and you should think about that really seriously because it's not going to lead where Jesus promises if you're not following him. There's a third stage to Jesus' work of discipleship in the Gospel of John. Come see calls us to revelation. Follow calls us to transformation. And the third stage, go in my name, it calls us to the mission of the kingdom, to reflect Jesus to others. Not just to adore Jesus, that's great, it brings worship, it brings conversion. Not just to be transformed, that's great, it brings a personal pilgrimage that brings redemption and the glory of God back to the image of God in your life and my life. But it calls us to the other man and woman as well, to look out for others to go in Jesus' name. John 20, verses 19 through 21. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. 
When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. It's after the resurrection. Jesus has been crucified, and his disciples are afraid. No surprise. When the person you're following, who told you once, take up your cross and follow me, gets crucified, that's a traumatic moment. And they're just huddled together thinking, man, what happened? We were on top of the world, and now he's been murdered. The, the religious powers lied about him. The governmental powers brutally killed him. The, the two things that should hold humanity in place if God isn't there turned on God's person. And now he shows up, and, and he calls them no longer to stay in a room, not just to be happy that he's alive and they know him, but to go. He commissions them as disciple missionaries. Every disciple is a person sent as well as called. You are called to Jesus and sent back out to people that Jesus seeks. No surprise. Jesus said he came to seek and save the lost. It's part of following after him, just as the Father sent him. He was sent to do the Father's will, the obedience to the plan of God. Just as the Father sent him, we have to go. He was sent to seek and save the lost. We have to be men and women who care about the ones who don't know Jesus. He was sent to serve, actively looking out for the other person and saying, how, how can I help this person know Jesus, even if it costs me something, even if it's sacrificial. As the Father sent Jesus, so he sends us. If Christians are citizens of another kingdom and disciples are the ones who follow after Jesus, we're the ones who have to represent that kingdom. He who gave his body for us now calls our bodies into his service. Seems completely fair and equitable, if you ask me. And true disciples of Jesus live not just together, but live sent. We live gathered, but we also live scattered. That's why we're both disciples and disciple makers. That's the whole balance of Christian discipleship. It's a process. It's a trip. It's not just, I arrive because I know Jesus, right? That's not the GPS moment of, you know Jesus. Your life is now fine. It's this whole process of following after. I've been thinking about GPSs because uh, I have Waze, uh, the app, and I realize now you can record your own voice on like 100 commands of this. So I thought my children who no longer live with me and don't have my immediate rule and direction in their lives anymore would really want that, that they would be able to be driving and hear dad go, Nice going. You have to do a U-turn now. Because I, I went off the script. I did it sort of my way. So we'll, we'll see. This is my plan. I don't know if it'll work or not. But it's the process. It's not the end. You've arrived. It's turn left, turn right. Another 1.5 European miles, which is what I call kilometers on ways. It's kind of fun. Um, and, and you just keep following. Discipleship's a matter of process and progress, not a claim to perfection, not being done. Christianity is a confession of a couple things. One, that we are sinful and broken people who need to be redeemed. That we've done so much sin, our souls and hands are unclean. That we've been so sinned against that we're broken and our, our souls are shattered like shards of glass. And it's going to take a lot of time to unmess up all the messed up of this world. That's process. We're going to have to wait and say, Jesus, we believe you have this. I don't understand how you're going to be able to do the air traffic control of this entire sinful world and bring it all in redemptive perfection and beauty to yourself, separating the wheat and the chaff one day, but I trust you to do that, Jesus. But I can see where that takes time, and the discipleship process has to go on, and we become part of that process. We're called to participate in this. Matthew 28, 16 through 20, let me read this, and I'm pretty sure this is the last passage I'm reading today. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said, In heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age break this down. Jesus is now risen. The disciples are no longer hiding in the room. Jesus has actually commanded them to do something, to get out of the rooms and to meet him outside somewhere at this high vantage point of a mountain. And they follow. They pass the first low hurdle test of discipleship. Jesus told you to do something, and you did that something. And they show up, and they're still them. The Bible says these ones who followed after the resurrection, 
did two things, worshiped and doubted. That, that's okay. That's legitimate. It's authentic. You can be a Christian and have doubts. You, you can have worship in your heart, be thrilled Jesus is there, and still have a lot of pain and confusion. That's okay. Your expectation for discipleship can't just be all I do is worship and I'm just thrilled by the revelation of Jesus all day long. There will be moments where there's doubt and confusion and pain, but you follow through those. That's what disciples do. They don't walk away because they don't understand something or through a tough patch. And these ones who follow, now worship and doubt. And then Jesus commands them. And the command is make disciples. I know it can look like go is the command in English, but it's not in the Greek. It's the make disciples. That The participle of go is sort of uh, while you're going, Go, make disciples. In the course of your going, make disciples. That's the imperative piece, is to make disciples. The assumption Jesus had, I think, is like what we know and live. You're going to be on the go. You're going to do things. You're going to go out and do errands. You're going to go to work. You're going to go to family functions. You're, you're just going to meet people randomly in the street as you're talking one day or at an airport. While you're going, no matter where you're going, no matter what that looks like, it's incredibly democratic, this call to discipleship. If you're rich, while you're going and doing stuff, make disciples. If you're poor, while you're going and doing stuff, make disciples. If you're really physically healthy and you work out all the time and you're just staving off death daily, go and make disciples. If you're really unhealthy and you, you just eat a lot of food that isn't great for you and you're just like fast tracking to your funeral, go and make disciples. Like no matter who you are and what you're doing, make disciples. That, that's the command. The process looks like this. Teach people. Teach what Jesus said. Well, that means we're constantly having to learn what Jesus said. We can't just be the ones who say, well, I have it down. I'll teach everything. We have to be the ones who are learning so that we can then share with others what we've done. Reading the Bible is not one of those optional things. If we're going to be constantly growing in grace and knowledge in the word of the Lord, we need to constantly pour into that. And we teach them to obey, which means we need to be obedient too. It can't just be knowledge. With everything that we're learning, there's a new weight of obedience. It's like what Ezra writes in Ezra 7, 10, or it's written about Ezra. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. To know, to do, and to teach. Know these things, be obedient, make disciples. It's discipling the nations and those who don't know. But there's discipleship that happens in the church as well. Titus 2 will talk about older women making disciples of younger women. It's implied for the men, but specifically there it says about the women. Second Timothy 2, we see Paul training leadership, making disciples who will take particular roles. Ephesians 6 talks about fathers discipling children. And other pastors will have mothers discipling children. Hebrews 3 says that we should all be encouraging each other. We should all be discipling each other. Everyone should be looking to other people in the church saying, how can I help them have their eyes on Jesus? If you love the people in this church, or you want to try to keep practicing getting better at loving people in this church. Encouraging one another in Jesus is a great way to do that. Receiving that from other people. Don't just be the know-it-all who finishes everyone's sentences for them when they talk about God. Let, let them encourage you. And, and encourage other people. When you see something, actually engage and help somebody out. Not, not with a judgmental finger wag, but pastorally. To encourage following after Jesus the way the Bible presents it. First Peter talks about all Christians using their giftedness to serve each other in discipleship ways. In Acts 18, there's this great scene where Priscilla and Aquila, who are a couple who serve in the early church, actually help Apollos, who's a leader, who's speaking and teaching. He's a young Jewish guy. He's eager, and he'll develop into a great missionary. And they, it says after he spoke and was preaching about Jesus, they pulled him aside and said, hey, man, let us talk to you so you can actually understand what it is you are saying up there, right? They're, they're, they were discipling this older couple, a young preacher, which I think is awesome that they didn't just sit there and go, well, I, I just better just let him do his thing. He's the pastor. No, nope. they, they actually said, you're eager, you're young, you're doing great, but we want you to know these things. And we later see Apollos is one of those guys who is converting cities and helping disciple cities. We, we need to be people who are discipling, not just out there in the nations, but in here in the church. We're going to gather for communion. The, the band's going to come up. And what I'm going to do is just ask us to have about a minute of silent prayer before we celebrate communion, which is a call that calls for a response. It's a call again to know that Jesus died for our sins, his body was broken for sin, that his blood was shed for sin, and that he wants us to know him and know forgiveness. Now, here's what I want you to do. 
in that minute of prayer, take some time to ask yourself and ask the Spirit to help you see, how is my discipleship going? How am I being formed more like Jesus? And take time to say to Jesus, here's where I think I'm, I'm seeing you well. Here's where I think I'm following well. Would you help me do that? It's by grace that we accomplish these things. And your places of struggle, just so you can say them openly to Jesus today. Let him know. This, this is where I doubt. This is where I'm sinning. This is where I think I forgot to even look at you. And do business with Jesus. Turn your eyes back on him. Orient your life back to following after him. And then once we do that, if you're his, you're invited to come up and share communion together. We'll all be called together around Jesus. And at the end of the service, we'll all be sent out as a sent church. Let's pray together. I'll lead us in all of silent prayer. Father in heaven, we ask that you would give us strength to hear you call us again to see Jesus, to fix our eyes on Jesus, to follow Jesus, to turn our hands and feet willfully into instruments of your will, and to reflect Jesus, to go out and look for others and not become self-satisfied. Father, we just want to take some time now to be able to talk to you about our own discipleship of following you, Jesus. And we pray you would help us to hear and to be honest and be transformed even in this time of prayer. Lord, as sons and daughters who have seen and followed and struggle to follow still, give us grace, Lord, in those struggles, but give us joy in how we've been changed and help us now to worship you out of that joy. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's, um, let's use these next two songs to...